Hey guys, this is Camfrey15, back at it with another video for you guys. And I'm back with another fairy tale arc review. And yes, we are finally here. Finally, I can talk about bigger and better things. Holy crap. Yeah, again, if you guys have been following along this uh, arc review series, you guys know the pain and suffering. I had to go through when it came to re-watching the Eclipse Celestial Spirits arc. Well, now I don't have to watch that arc anymore. Good. Anyways, let's not talk about that. And like I said, let's move on to bigger and better things. And that is the prologue to the Tartarus arc. The amazingly made Tartarus arc. Holy crap. Yes, we're here, starting the Tartarus arc or the Tartarus saga, but we get the prologue to the Tartarus arc, and that is the Sun Village arc. Obviously, if you don't know what the Sun Village arc is, uh, the Sun Village arc is the arc that takes right before takes takes place right before Tartarus. It's only a few chapters and a few episodes, really very relatively short arc, but still. It foreshadows the un the incoming events of Tartarus. Now, obviously, if you're going to ask me, why didn't you just combine this with the Tartarus arc? I kind of want to make this uh, its own little arc on its own. So, yeah. Um, so, if the video is shorter than what you've been getting as of late, I'm sorry. But that's what this arc is. It's a shorter video. It's a short. It's a pretty short arc. Like, literally... The, the manga chapters the Sun Village arc covers are chapter 341 to 355, and the anime covers these this part of the story from ep anime episodes 227 to 233. That goes to show you how short this arc is. It's not relatively long. It's the buildup, the calm before the storm, essentially, you know, before Tartaros gets kicked off and that starts the whole stuff and everything. Anyways... Let's get going on with this arc review. So we start the arc review. We start the arc off with uh, the fairy tale girls in a very fan service scene, taking baths and stuff like that. It's mostly the main fairy tale girls, with the exception of Wendy and Urza, because they're off doing a guild play that Urza likes to uh, always copy. And I think in the anime, it's supposed to be a reference. I don't know how they do it in the manga, but in the anime, I think. It's a reference to Rave Master, the very first series Mashima did, because that's the play I guess they're doing it on, because Wendy dressed up like that one Kinatsu lookalike character with the white hair. Um, so, yeah, but um, in this whole bath scene, we see Flair, and she's actually there. We find out that Raventil actually disbanded, and she really doesn't have a place to go home to. Now, we know Flair... Honestly, after the Grand Magic Games arc has been kind of a good guy person. It's just funny because she says she's been stalking Lucy or following Lucy around. And, well, here she followed her here. Um, they ask her if she would like to join Fairy Tale, but she's like, no, I don't think I will. Um, and stuff like that. Now, after Lucy comes back from the bath, she goes to her room or her apartment and Urza and Wendy already there, which gives you a lovely, uh, like early fairy tale vibes when everybody would just come into our room unannounced and stuff like that. Oh, and then I also forgot to uh, mention if you're watching this part of the anime, when I did my Grand Magic Games review for part two, I did say that the colors are definitely bleaked out and they're not, it's, it's not as colorful as it used to be. Well, the Grand Magic Games arc in the back half was, and even the Eclipse Celestial Spirits arc, they did have some color. They did show some color. Here, let me just say this. They totally take out the coloring and the, you know, color contrast and the stuff out of this. They want to make you, they want to, the anime made it known that we want the Tartarus arc to be the darkest arc, and we're going to show you just from how it looks visually. When I mean the sky in the freaking Tartarus arc, when they show it, when it's blue, looks a little bit gray. 
they're, they definitely turn on, tone down the coloring because they want to make it known like, oh, no, this is going to be a dark arc and we're going to turn down the coloring and we're going to make it a little bit more blacker, a little bit more darker, yada, yada, yada. Now, again, like I said, honestly, I appreciate the artistic change because you are going to, if not the darkest arc of the series. And even I said this in my Grand Magic Games arc. Them turning down the colors, I think, was a good choice because at the end of the Grand Magic Games arc, and mostly even in the Tartos arc, they're the darkest arcs of the series. So toning down the colors obviously was good. Now, obviously, by the time they get to the next part of the story, which is really the Alvarez Empire arc, they do turn up the colors a bit back to like what it used to be because I'm guessing most people complain that there's barely any color to begin with. Um, so the thing is, um, yeah, so that's one thing I forgot to mention that, hey, I totally, that totally passed my mind. So yeah, now the one thing we find out is Gray and Natsu went on a quest together and they haven't been seen since like three days or something like that. And they're wondering if they're having trouble. So those three, the three girls go to the forest. They actually, they eventually find them. They are just in some sort of fight to see who's better. They're typical Natsu versus Gray type of thing. They accidentally punch Urza, um, which funny enough, Natsu does two times this arc where he actually hits Urza and Urza gets massively pissed off at him. Like, do not ever do that again. Um, so eventually when they get back, um, Makarov receives a special request um, from the fourth French wizard, um, Saint Ward Sequin. Um, we also do find out that Ward is also ranked fourth in strength of the four gods of Ishgar. Essentially, we know the four gods of Ishgar are essentially the people that are the, like literally the strongest wizards in all of Fiore. That's what they are. They're essentially there. Now, they so show a silhouette of the others and stuff like that. But, um, you know, we don't see them. And we're not going to see the other the other gods of Ishgar, I believe my recollection, if I can remember, not till Alvarez, Empire. So other than that, that's kind of it. So we go to see, see that this guy is very important. And to mock off the way he's talking, he's like, you will behave yourself. Like, he's not even joking and stuff like that. So... Eventually, it's supposed to be only Natsu and Gray, but obviously because there's a little beef going on, Wendy, Lucy, and Urza all go with him. Urza kind of has another armor type of chain. She's wearing, like, I guess, less side armor type of stuff. Um, but, hey, I like the new design. Uh, Wendy went back to wearing her, her Edelis jacket, um, the one Edelis design she had um, and everything. Um, Lucy, her new hair design is she's got two pigtails now, so... Hey, uh, it is what it is. And she's wearing very high, high shorts. Um, honestly, booty volleyball shorts. So, yeah, and then it is a tank top. So, anyways, what happens is they eventually go over to Ward's house. They're kind of weird out. And Ward is literally a plant man. He's got the face of a plant. But when you flash back to his past, he literally looks like he's a human. So I wonder if his magic affected him to where he looks like a plant. But um, essentially, we find out that Ward... His whole thing is he likes to go around the world, you know, growing plants out and everything. And across one of his journeys to bring life to a desert, um, he comes across this village called um, the Village of the Sun. And the Village of the Sun actually has this, you know, I guess you can say this monument called the, um, the Eternal Flame, which essentially is an everlasting flame that grants the people of the village, it's protection, like divine protection, essentially. Now, the thing is, um, he says when he went there, he saw the entire village frozen, and there was not one person that lived there and everything. And essentially, um, he asked them, like, hey, I need you to go to the Sun, sun, to sun Village and uh, find a way to defrost the ice. So that's the thing. Um we do get a nice scene where he's like, I'll take you there easily by using this plant. And in the meantime, Ward actually reflects, reflects back into his past. And he remembers the time back when he was in fairy tale with Mavis. 
So at this point, we find out, oh, he was a part of fairy tale. He later tells at the end of the arc, um, not soon the others, that he was one of the first founders of fairy tale. But it was a pretty interesting, you know, shocking thing in like my first watching. Wait, this guy knew who Mavis was and he was a part of fairy tale. So, you know, that's the whole thing. Anyways, when they get to Sun Village, they see everything Warren's talking about. Um, the fact that, you know, the entire village is frozen. The fact that, well, guess what? There's giants in here, too. So I guess you can say just like the One Piece world, there are giants in the fairy tale world. Now, um, Gray makes a mention about the ice being different than his typical ice and the fact that it gives off a, that it's given off a special type of magic. Then all of a sudden, they run into these treasure hunters from this treasure hunting guild called Sylph Ra Labyrinth. And we find out their names are Drake, Hiroshi, and Rala. Now, we see that they have a bottle of the of liquid moon drip that they say can essentially defrost the ice. So it's kind of like a whole thing back to, like, I guess, the Galuna Island arc with Deliora. It's a fun fact. Even any, any even more of a coincidence that the fact that Gray, you know, this entire arc feels like he gets the same type of feelings from the Deliora incident here. And stuff like that. So we kind of get individual fights with the treasure hunters. And oh man, I'm tired. Um, Natsu fights Rala, Gray fights Hiroshi, Lucy and Wendy fight Drake, um, and stuff like that. Now, eventually, Gray and Natsu they eventually don't leave their fights because well, Natsu walks off or runs off later, but I'll talk about that later. Now we see uh, this weird-looking one-eyed Cyclops bird, and we see two people on it. One, um, we see a guy named Dorate, and then we see Minerva returning to the storyline, and she is in this dark guild called Succubus Eye. Um, now, they're showing up at Sun Village, and they know that fairy tale's there, and Minerva's kind of on her whole little entourage of, I need to get my revenge on fairy tale for what happened to us at the or what happened to me at the Grand Magic Games. Mostly, I want to get my revenge on Urza for what she did to me um, at the Grand Magic Games. So pretty interesting. And this starts the whole, I guess you can say, arc for Minerva um, in this whole thing. Now we see Urza after while all the other people are fighting, all her not when the others are fighting. Urza's looking around the village, wondering like. Why were they, why were the giants looking like in some sort of position where like they were trying to protect something? And essentially she's trying to find the eternal flame. So the thing is she walks back and then she ends up finding the eternal flame, but she sees that it's frozen. Now she's trying to find a way to see if there's a way to activate it to melt the ice or anything, but she can't and anything. But then that's when she looks into one of the ice uh, the ice reflection to herself and she sees herself as a little kid now in my first watch I'm like what the hell is going on here why is she a kid again um, so yeah now that's when we see Kid Urza eventually run into Minerva and essentially Minerva is like oh look at you little Urza that means I'm only going to have a better chance to kill you so the thing is, one, Urza is like Minerva, and that's when she sees her guild mark, and she sees that she's a part of a dark guild now. And she's Urza's like, why would you join a dark guild? You do know Sting and Rogue have been looking for you. They want you to rejoin Sabretooth. And Minerva at this point in time doesn't care. Again, Minerva at this point, at this point in the storyline, she sees everybody as essentially weak pawns to her, essentially weaklings to her. And that's what she classifies Sting and Rogue. She's like, who needs those guys? They're weaklings and they, who held me back, who didn't let me achieve what they wanted. What's the point? Sabretooth just became another pathetic, weak guild-like fairy tale and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, now, now, in the battle with the uh, treasure hunters, they were throwing her, they finally, Natsu finally gets hold of the moon drip and they start passing around. I don't know why. But okay, um, they throw, Carla throws it at Happy, and Happy totally doesn't catch it. It breaks, and then uh, that moon drip is wasted, literally. But it's not like they were going to do anything with the moon drip to save the village as a whole, because guess what? It was like, honestly, like, just 
probably like a little pint of it in there. Um, now, the one thing about Natsu is he gets this feeling that he hears this voice that is familiar to him. So he walks off. Eventually, he runs into Dorate, and Dorate uses his magic like the, the, like the age of regression and essentially turns Natsu into a kid. So we find out that Dorate has the abilities to turn uh, other people into kids. That's his magic power and everything. So, yeah. Now, um, eventually, because Natsu's already gone and he's also running away from Dorate, um, Wendy and Lucy end up fighting the treasure hunters. But when it looks like Drake is about to shoot Wendy, uh, Flair shows up and saves them. Now, again, like I said, Urza starts, or Minerva starts attacking Urza and stuff like that now. And it's kind of where Urza is getting destroyed and Minerva is just like, oh, <laughs> I'm loving this scene. This is so great. And I'm like, she's evil and she's despicable. Now, Lucy, Wendy, and Flair, eventually looks like they get all captured and, you know, put into a corner. Um, but together, they work together and they end up defeating the treasure hunters of Sylph, Labyrinth, and they're done. So, yeah. Now, the end thing is, after getting away um, from Dorate, Nazlu ends up finding the um, Eternal Flame. He just doesn't know it's the Eternal Flame. And also, too, Gray starts his fight coming across Dorate. Um, at first, Gray is older, but then Dorate uses again his magic to get the upper hand on Gray and turn him into a kid again. The one thing, too, we see when he turns him into a kid, um, he gets these nightmares about Deliora and stuff like that. It isn't until, like, you know, the spirit of Ultir in Gray's consciousness tells him, hey, you know, he's tricking you. Do not fall for it. You've been a gup against this. You felt pain and suffering, yada, yada, yada. You know, so eventually he snaps out of it and he's about to start his fight with uh, Dorate, even though he's a little kid. Now, we actually cut over to Flair, Lucy, and Wendy, and essentially we find out some information about Flair with the fact that she used to live in Sun Village. This was her original home. And she eventually left to get accustomed to regular people. But when she came across people her size, she was kind of afraid. And she kind of became really a person on the streets. It wasn't until Ivan, the master of Raventail, former master of Raventail, found her and then took her into her guild. And then that's when she's like, well, that's when he taught me up to take action against fairy tale and stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty interesting to get some backstory. <sighs> hey. Good God. I know this is a pre-recorded video, but my God, technically this is live, so whatever. Um, anyways, um, as I was saying, um, she, you know, she was found off the streets and essentially, you know, that's when she realizes like, oh, you know, Master Ivan wants me to take a fairy tale and stuff like that. And the reason why she came, came back is because she doesn't want to see her home like this and everything. Now, cutting back to the Great Dorothy fight, Gray actually starts to realize that the ice is different. So he comes up with an idea to channel um, the ice magic power and transfer the attack to Tarate, mostly because he thinks of the whole idea from the standpoint of, well, with my regular ice, um, it didn't really affect um, Dorate. But when Dorate fell onto essentially leaves in the same ice, it actually hurt him um, and stuff like that. So... What happens is eventually, you know, um, and this is like when, and, and the fun fact at this time, Happy and Carla meet up with him and everything. And two, um, eventually Gray antagonizes Dorate long enough at this point where he's like, oh, you can't defeat me. You're a coward if you can, you're only fighting me as a kid. So then he literally powers up, looks like a legit demon. Um, even freaking Gray is like, you look something like Deliora, like Deliora. And he uses this one magic where he literally turns everybody in the area, in the vicinity, to a little kid. Um, that includes Minerva. And one of the things, that actually going back to the Minerva versus Urza fight, since Urza was always on and off turning from a kid, um, when it looked like Minerva was about to like literally stab Urza with her own sword, Urza finally grows back to being an adult, but only to get back um, to a kid. One thing I did find funny is the fact that Minerva points out when after Urza gets back um, to being an adult, she's like, uh, you're wearing nothing underneath. I think you should look at yourself. And she's clearly wearing nothing because that would be where her skirt is when she's wearing her full armor and everything. Um, 
Also goes to show you that Urza doesn't wear, I guess, underwears, I guess. Now, we didn't see. Apparently, she was butt-ass naked. Um, but then again, her underwears would be probably bigger than they are. So, yeah. But what I did find funny is how Urza matches still Minerva's skirt, uh, skirt. And she's like, oh, yeah. But uh, you should probably look down at yourself as well. And you see Urza or Minerva essentially in her underwears. And that just pisses Minerva off because... Minerva just utterly hates Urza and wants to embarrass Urza and stuff like that. And two, apparently she also says, well, if Urza unleashes her Nakagami starlight or not her Nakagami armor, I have something to counter that. So we don't know what that is. Um, so that's the interesting thing there. Um, but as I was saying, Happy and Carla end up finding Grey. And anyways, like I said, in the fight with Dorate, Grey managed to channel the ice um, to, and use it as a way to attack Dorate, and it has a massive effect on Dorate, and he ends up defeating Dorate. So when he walks up to Dorate, essentially Dorate's like, well, you done it now, you clown. Now you just unlocked the gates to the netherworld. Essentially, if you then, if you forgot from my Grand Magic Games arc review part two, um, Cobra made a mention of the fact that the gates of the netherworld are about to open, um, which Jalal already knew that Tartaros was coming. And essentially, Gray, you can say, opened the gates to Tartaros being an influence in this arc. So everybody thank Gray for making Fairy Tale eventually by the time the Tartaros arc ends, disband. Um, so yeah. Now, when ha when the event when the others meet up with each other, essentially that bird comes in one, the bird actually eats Dorate whole, and they're getting chased by the bird. So Natsu and Gray you know, kind of do a nice little half five. Now going to take care of the bird dude and Gray's going to take care of unfreezing the Eternal Fire's eyes. Now, Gray channels the eyes like he did with Dorate, but it looks like the Eternal Fire's not there. But then again, you see this little speck. So then they're like, Natsu can power it up. So Natsu literally unleashes a full out assault on the bird. And that's when we find out that the Eternal Flame uh, um, it was Atlas Flame. Now, Wendy brought Atlas Flame back because she felt the same presence, you know, back from the Grand Magic Games arc like she did with Zirconis. And this is when we have Atlas Flame, you know, come out and says some things. Now, he says at first he has some trouble remembering some things because it's been a long time. It's been 400 years. And since he was encased in that ice, you know, he doesn't remember most anything. But when he does finally remember, he ends up saying that the person who froze this village was an ice wizard who used demon slain magic. Um, and he thought Atlas Flame was some sort of demon, and that's why he froze the entire village. He also says, too, to not so specifically, that there was one demon from the Book of Zareph um, that Igniel, um, obviously the legendary fire dragon, um, couldn't defeat. And that demon was the demon known as END. Yes, this starts the END storyline. Now, I'm not going to spoil it till we eventually, when it eventually gets revealed who END is. But obviously, when I was first watching this, like, END, who the fudge? And essentially, the thing we hear about END is he's the strongest demon in the Book of Zareph. And we see him for the next couple of arcs get hyped up. And stuff like that, or the fact like, oh, E and D, that's a guy you don't want to fuck with. Otherwise, you're gonna get screwed. Um, and stuff like that. So um yeah. Um, but eventually what happens is the spirit of Alice Flame goes away and he uses the remaining his remaining lifespan to be able to unfreeze all of the demon slain ice. Um, and all the giants and everything is restored back to normal. The Eternal Flame is just a regular flame. Atlas Flame isn't controlling it. So I do like the fact that they had a little that they, they had the lore of the fact that well, when Atlas Flame got sent back to you know his timeline of the Eclipse Gate incident, he essentially ended up in some village and became their Eternal Flame. They're essentially their protection, their, their deity, their god of protection. Now we cut over to this winter snowy area. And we see somebody, some, I guess, random freaking dude come up to this guy. And um, he's like, listen, man, uh, 
you have to go attend this meeting um, for the nine uh, demon gapes of Tartarus, man. You have to do this. Otherwise, you're going to get pissed and everything. And essentially, he turns around and he's like, all right, fine. I'll go to this. I slay demons and stuff like that. And so I'm not going to kill you. And we find out his name is Absolute Zero, Zero Silver, um, who has a pretty interesting uh, design um, and looks awfully familiar to a character we all know um, and stuff like that. Hell, his earrings are kind of a dead giveaway. Um, so, yeah. Now, when we cut back, um, essentially, Gray deduces mostly about this whole thing is the fact that, well, this is because of Tartaros, that Tartaros is behind it because they find out, because he remembers the fact that, um, obviously, Dorate brought up the whole, oh, you unlocked the gates of the netherworld and stuff like that, and the fact that, obviously, he was affected by demon slaying magic, which also sh shows that he um, was a demon himself. Um, I don't know if they said Dorate was a, a demon from the book of Zare, but um, they said he was a demon and everything, and that's why they're thinking like, oh, Tartarus is definitely behind this and stuff like that. Um, we get a nice heartfelt reunion with Flair and the Giants, and the Giants say, listen, you can leave and come back whenever you want to. It was a very nice scene, very emotional scene, and it was a good way to close off the Fair Flair character. I like the fact that, you know, Flair, you know, she was introduced as an antagonist, but then she gained something from Lucy by, you know, looking up to looking up to Lucy and respecting her um, about the kindness she showed to her. And, you know, sometimes good things happen to good people that are kind to others. And Flair, you know, she turned her life around and she seems like she's living a happy life. And it's a nice emotional moment there. Um, because you clearly can see that Flair does care about the Giants as much as the Giants care about her. Like, the Giants, you know, call her daughter, because to them, that's like a daughter to them. Flair's a daughter to them. So uh, let's wrap up this arc, and then I can get up out of here. So we actually see Minerva go back to the guild, her guild hall, the Succubus Eye Guild Hall, and she sees that none of her guild mates are there, and the fact that the guild is kind of destroyed and everything. But she sees, like, these black type of, you know, stick people and stuff like that. And then that's when we see one of the other nine demon gates of Tartaros, Kiyoka. Oh, brother. I'm just going to say this. If you thought Eclipse Celestial Spirit, you know, freaking Virgo was such of a torturer, my God. Kiyoka eats her for breakfast. Holy shit. When we talk about the Tartarus arc, trust and believe. Kiyoka is the type of bitch that literally makes you feel pain tenfold. Anyways, Kiyoka's like, oh, I was trying to enhance, find ways to enhance your guildmates, but they just couldn't pass the test. So I guess I'm going to enhance you next, Minerva. Um, and essentially, they were kind of, she was, Sugibus I was kind of sent under the orders um, and Kyoko was kind of set to go after Tartar, uh, Succubus people under really just her really own free will from Tartaros and stuff like that. So, yeah. Now, after they get back from Sun Village um, and they talk to Warred, um, one, Warred tells Natsu and the others that he was one of the first founders of Fairy Tale with Mavis. Um, and again, it goes to show you, like, this dude's like thousands of years old, essentially, like a few hundred years like old and stuff like that which is crazy and everything so obviously fairy tale Natsu and the others have a much more higher respect for him and everything now Natsu actually asked him like hey he's like hey uh ward do you know anything about these this the demon from the book of Zareph E&D and war is like oh book of Zareph huh Zareph that's an interesting name I've heard that name for quite a while um so we, all, we also get implied that, well, Vora knows of Zareph, the name of Zareph and who he is. Um, but in terms of E&D, Vora's like, yeah, don't ask me about E&D. I know nothing about what the hell E&D is, um, but it definitely doesn't sound good. But Vora says, um, when they come up about bringing about Tartaros, he says, well, you see, the interesting thing about Tartaros is the fact that the only information known about them is the fact that they're really just a dark guild. 
Other than that, we don't know anything. There's speculation of the fact that apparently their guild is made up of a bunch of devil worshippers and stuff like that. And as under that's when War kind of says, oh yeah, uh, their guild essentially is demons. So they're not even people, they're just demons and stuff like that. And that's when Ward kind of ends the arc of saying, well, yeah, another pretty interesting thing, apparently from rumors I heard about Tartarus is the fact that apparently they have at least one of the demons of the Book of Zareth um, in their possession, in their guild. And, you know, essentially it has not to be like, what the hell? So, yeah, and then Natsu's like, but don't worry, we'll die, I'll defeat Tartarus and stuff like that. And that's kind of where the arc ends off. And then, yeah. But um, like I said, I told you, this video is probably going to be shorter than the rest because, again, like I said, this is just a prologue to Tartaros. Um, I love the setup they do with Tartaros with Minerva and Dorate, especially Dorate, the fact that he, after a great defeat, he is like, oh, you've done it now. You just unracked all hell on Earth and you just doomed the fairy tale world as we know it because you just unleashed Tartaros on the world. Um, and then we only and we only see two of the demon gates of Tartarus in this arc, which are Kyoka and Silver, which we know if you've seen Fairy Tale, um, they're pretty important and pretty integral to the Tartarus arc um, and stuff like that. We also get introduced to you know obviously another wizard saint as well as we get introduced to the whole concept of the four gods of Ishgar. As fact, was, we get one of the first founders of Fairy Tale in Ward, who we'll see occasionally here and there, but his stuff will get fleshed out in the Fairy Tale Zero arc, which takes place after the Tartaros arc. Um, but, you know, I uh, the one thing I also did like, especially even for a first watcher for this series, is the fact that I love how they build up the fact that, oh, well, guess what? You know... You still don't know Tartaros. Hell, I mentioned back in my Arashion Sage review, the fact that they mentioned the Barham Alliance of the Tartaros Guild, how they mentioned them all that very, very far away and stuff like that. Even back then when they always brought up Tartaros, even a little bit in um, the Tenral Island arc with Vermar Hearts and everything. We you know, we were, all, we were from the start with Tartaros, we're led to believe like, oh, nobody knows what the hell Tartaros is and where they are, like Ward even says, like nobody knows where their guild hall is, where they reside at, who's in their guild, how many people are in their guild. We know nothing. And I like the fact that they build up the, the, the intrigue and the mystery of like, what actually is the Tartarus guild? Like, who, who, who are they consisted of and everything? Um, and that's when, and obviously we know that they're, they consist of the nine demon gates. Um, but I love the fact that they built up the Tartarus arc. And again, like I said, they built up, they essentially established Tartarus was a thing in the series from the Arashion Seis arc. The Arashion Seis, by my recollection, was very early in the storyline. And I made, and I remember saying in the video, like, to just think of the fact that they mentioned Tartarus that early on in the series goes to show you how crazy that is, how crazy that was. Um... But, um, but, the, but this was obviously the prologue, obviously the intro to the Tartarus arc. And like I said, it's the calm before the storm. Um, you know, like literally, legitimately, it's a calm before the storm. That last scene in, with Ward, yes, it's supposed to build up like the mystery of like, who's E&D? You know, who is, what's the Tartarus guild? But at the same time, you have a happy moment where it's obviously these fairy tale members reconnecting and connecting with Warred, obviously a past member of Fairy Tale and everything. And that's just really the calm before the storm. So yeah, I enjoyed this arc for just the buildup it has and stuff like that. So next Monday, uh for premiere for the premiere of Fairy Tale Arc Review, we will be talking about Tartarus Arc Part One. Now I don't know where I'm going to stop in my part one. I believe I will probably stop at the part when the Tartaros Guild essentially is flying above Magnolia. Um, so I think that's where I'm going to stop at. I think that would be a good middle place part to put there because, yeah. Um, so I think I'll stop. I think that's where I'm going to 
stop part one. So it's going to be the start of the Tartarus arc to the point we see the Tartarus Guild Hall literally flying over the city of Magnolia to take the fight to Fairy Tail. Um, but other than that, um, that's kind of it. So if you guys like this video, leave a like. Put in the comment section your thoughts on the Sun Village arc. Did you like the build-up or were you not a fan of it? Other than that, um, hit that subscribe button if you want to get more fairy tale content, as well as hit that, and when you do hit that subscribe button, make sure you're up to date with whatever I upload to the channel and you hit that notification bell icon. So uh, other than that, guys, I'll catch you guys next Monday for the highly anticipated review of the Tartarus arc, the per first part. It just really covers the first half of the arc. So I'll see you guys next Monday for the highly anticipated Tartarus arc review. So then guys, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace.